maybe. Watching Euphoria for the first time in 2023 was a strange experience. Back when season one released in 2019, it seemed like everyone was raving about it, even people whose opinions I really trusted. But since then, Euphoria season two has come out and series creator Sam Levinson has also dropped things like Malcolm and Marie and most recently, the idol. And because of all of that, at least in whatever algorithmic rabbit hole I'm currently entrenched in, sentiments surrounding Euphoria have done a complete 180. I struggle to find anyone saying good things about it now. So whether I loved it or hated it or felt somewhere in between, I felt like having a take on Euphoria was a losing battle. There is nothing I can say that hasn't already been said or won't piss people off. But here I am talking about it, so I might as well just rip the band-aid and say I watched it, trying my best to ignore the internet noise and the extremely bitter taste the idol left me with, and I actually kinda liked it. I know, I'm shocked too. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. On paper, Euphoria sounds like the kind of thing I would despise. It shares many qualities with shows I've been heavily critical of in the past, like American Horror Story, and of course, I don't even want to say the title anymore. Euphoria is tailor-made to be controversial. Here's your warning for spoilers, as well as a huge content warning for abuse, including child abuse, drug use, sexual violence, self-harm, fat phobia, homophobia, and transphobia. If you feel that engaging in any way with the following topics puts you at risk of harm, please click away now because it's kind of the entire show. Euphoria at its core is about a girl named Rue, who is a struggling drug addict who tries to simultaneously battle the disease of addiction and maintain her interpersonal relationships, mainly a new one she's forming with a girl named Jules, which realistically could have been an entire show's worth of story on its own, but the show quickly expands into a large tapestry of different characters in their various internal and social drama, which involves a lot of drugs and trauma and sex, lots and lots of sex, and all these characters are teenagers. Obviously, like I said, the show is problematic at conception. There are a lot of solid cases to make against Euphoria, like it being overly gratuitous, or that the show is style over substance, that the show's depictions of taboo material sends bad messages to its audience, or how Sam Levinson begins to prioritize himself at the expense of major characters in the second season. Speaking of which, go watch Broy Deschanel's excellent video, Euphoria and the Art of Navel Gazing, after this video, if you haven't already. It is so sharp and insightful. And I'm not really here to tell anybody they're wrong for feeling those things about the show, I'm just here to talk about how I feel about it. And don't get me wrong, my feelings on Euphoria are definitely conflicting in a lot of ways. I certainly have issues with it. But I don't think those issues are as big of a detriment to Euphoria as other people make them out to be, and in fact, I sometimes find them to work in the show's favor. And overall, I thought Euphoria was good. Not amazing, certainly not flawless, but good. But why does Euphoria get a pass from me where other shows don't? Well, if you'll allow me, I'm going to attempt to explain myself as best as I can by recounting my feelings on everything Euphoria. Because if I'm going to dig myself into a hole, I might as well dig it six feet deep. Season one of Euphoria is easily the best overall package the series has offered so far. It feels largely cohesive, both in terms of plot and theme, in a way that the series will likely fail to ever fully recapture. Like many others, I found myself first and foremost drawn to the characters. I'll be honest and say that they were all a little bit difficult to get into at first, seeing as how each of them seemed as equally unlikable as they did relatable. But over the course of the season, I grew to appreciate my conflicting feelings on these characters more and more, seeing as it made them each feel a lot more well-defined. They each have their own internal struggles and their own backstories, as explored by the really engaging cold opens, and sometimes those struggles and experiences manifest themselves in very beautiful ways, 
and sometimes they express themselves through pure ugliness. Nothing's ever really black and white, morally speaking. Even with a character I find entirely irredeemable, like Nate Jacobs. I spent so much of the season hoping to see something bad happen to him, some sort of cosmic revenge for all the awful things he had done. Then once it finally happened and he was completely emasculated by his father, I felt disgusted with myself for wanting that. All that being said though, I found myself most attached to Rue, which I suppose is a good thing given that her perspective is central to the show. I personally identified a lot with her mental struggles and how that bleeds through her life, through things like attachment issues and destructive behavior. It's very easy to root for a protagonist that is a fundamentally good person, but I found it in this case to be a much more rewarding experience to root for a character who is trying to be a good person in spite of themselves. I also really loved Jules, both as her own character and in her relationship to Rue. I found Jules's cold opening to be the most emotionally captivating, and I think that her perspective is easily the most unique one in the show. And I also think she just contrasts well with Rue to provide a pretty accurate and devastating look at the burden of young love. What it's like to be in that headspace where you don't know what you want or what love really even is yet, and you're trying to figure that out together with someone else and how messy that process can be. Rue, Jules, and their relationship together were the emotional center that kept me going through most of the show. Well, that and the excellent directing and cinematography. Which means I might as well just address the style over substance argument. It, it just rarely sits well with me. I think it's reductive. I just can't agree that style itself cannot be substance, because one, film is a visual medium. Of course the performances and cinematography play a role in how much people enjoy a show or a film. The script is the foundation, of course, but the technical aspects are vastly important to me, and personally I think a lot of this show, purely from a visual standpoint, is beautiful and substantive in its own right. Two, the visuals are often facilitating the emotions of the story. Yeah, Euphoria is an extremely flashy show, but I think that perfectly complements the explosive, volatile teenage feelings the show is exploring. Especially the carnival episode. The long, expansive one-take shot may be seen to some as a distraction, the director just showing off, but to me it was a perfect way to display the chaos of all this character drama being centralized to this one location. And lastly, three, the character writing and performances are the best part of the show anyway. As I attempted to explain earlier, each character is entirely defined by nuance, both in writing and performance, which makes them feel extremely substantial to me. And while I'd normally be hypercritical of how these characters are ultimately pitted in soap opera level interpersonal drama, I can forgive it a lot more here precisely because all of the major characters are teenagers. Soap opera drama and campiness makes a lot more sense in the context of high school than it does in, I don't know, an insane asylum filled with fully grown adults? Just an example. Having said that though, I will admit, the soap opera drama does muddy a lot of the show in terms of its subject matter. I don't believe that depiction is inherently equivalent to endorsement, and Euphoria is sometimes a good example of why. Take this scene with Jules as an example. You see her in a dimly lit motel parking lot, texting with a faceless man who is waiting for her inside one of the rooms. It's quite ominous, alerting the audience to the inherent danger of this encounter. And then it ups the ante with Rue's voiceover. Looking back on it, she probably would have just been better off going to McKay's. As Jules approaches the motel room, we cut to a wide dolly shot that follows her and shows her being more and more encompassed by a shroud of darkness. She makes it to the door, a faceless voice beckons her in, but the camera stays still. Now obviously I can't show what happens next, but when it ends with Jules making this face, and Rue's voiceover later explains that Jules dissociated through the entire experience, yeah, I just, I don't know how much more the show has to spell out that this was not a good thing. I do not believe the show is condoning this, 
and I don't believe that because of the filmmaking language that is being used. Yet still, at times, I found the level of gratuity in the show to be a bit much, to say the least, especially in regards to the sexual aspects. Now obviously, sexuality is a huge part of what the show is trying to explore, but sometimes it does feel like it's crossing the line, that intangible line of taste that will ultimately be different from person to person. This isn't exclusive to any one character or moment. Pretty much every character portrayed here crosses that gratuity line for me at one point or another, but I'll use Kat as an obvious example. I felt a great deal of empathy for her, and I ultimately saw value in what they were exploring through her character thematically. How her exploration of her own sexuality and discovery of how people secretly fetishize her behind closed doors led to her feeling empowered and self-confident even though it compromised her own safety and integrity. But even so, I felt uncomfortable with how gratuitous the show was with her at times. How many times do we need to see her having sex? How many details of each encounter are necessary to show? Again, it's an intangible line that people draw at completely different thresholds, but for me, it's a little much. But at the very least, it all feels intentional and often adds something of value to the overall picture, like complexity within a character study, or a biting piece of social commentary, or a hard-hitting reveal that creates new layers of empathy. The graphic, taboo depictions feel in service of something and rarely fail to get the intended emotional reaction out of me, which is more than I can say for many shows of this ilk. But as it progresses, Euphoria does reveal itself to be a show that often loses itself in its own minutia. While everything presented is emotional and engaging, many plot threads tend to feel disjointed or ultimately forgotten. The show, irritatingly, veers off course more than I'd like, but it somehow always manages to pull itself back from completely derailing. It's a show that feels messier and messier the longer you look at it in retrospect, so it makes sense to me that a lot of people over time would ultimately grow a distaste for it. But I think that in a vacuum, the first season has enough going for it that a lot of the messy plot feels forgivable. And if I didn't hear anything to the contrary, I would have assumed many of the loose threads would be addressed in the second season. We'll get there. Honestly though, I felt pretty content overall with where each character ended up by the end of season one. Every conclusion, while not always a happy ending, felt fitting. Cassie finally recognizes her self-worth doesn't need to be defined by someone else's desire for her, Kat gets into a healthy relationship, Maddie finally breaks the cycle of abuse and lets go of Nate. Nate is completely emasculated and basically left with nothing. Fezco's fate is left in limbo, as it seemingly has been for his entire life. Rue and Jules' relationship doesn't work out, and Jules ends up leaving for the city, and Rue relapses and presumably overdoses again, based on the lyrics to the closing song. Some of these endings are endearing, others are very bleak, but they all felt inevitable. I personally would have been fine with this being a self-contained miniseries. Even the messiness of the plot and the loose threads didn't mean much to me by the end because it also sort of added to the authenticity and raw humanity of the show. Things don't always work out, and sometimes you don't get closure. Those are some of the most painful things about life, in my experience. Personally, I just didn't need anything more. But I got more anyway. In the interim between seasons one and two, a couple of special episodes were released. Episodes I never would have even known existed at all had I not visited the Rotten Tomatoes page for Euphoria out of sheer curiosity. I never hear anyone talk about them, and holy sh why do I not hear anyone talk about them? I assume this is because the episodes are seen as filler, but to me, they are essential viewing. I enjoyed the first special episode more than the entire first season combined. It is some of the most compelling and emotionally stirring television I've seen in years, and it's just two characters sitting in a diner talking for an hour. The writing here is 
immaculate, especially the dialogue. I'm a sucker for characters who deliver long, philosophical monologues, and this episode delivers that in spades while also delving deeper into Ali and Rue as characters. Now, Sam Levinson is clearly using Ali as a bit of a self-insert here throughout the episode, which can be a bit racially clumsy in some brief moments. But apart from that, I think this episode has a lot of genuine wisdom for its audience. This is why the world keeps getting worse. People keep doing shit that we deem unforgivable, and in return, they decide there's no reason to change. So now you got a whole bunch of people running around who don't give a fuck about redemption. That's scary. The thought of maybe being a good person is what keeps me trying to be a good person. In Rue's final words, I just don't plan on being here that long. The world's just really fucking ugly, you know? Everybody seems to be okay with it, you know? The anger, the level of anger. Everyone's just out to make everyone else not seem human. And I don't really want to be a part of it. I don't even want to witness it. I mean, um, I relate to that more than I'm comfortable sharing in this video. Overall, it's just, it's just powerful stuff. So much so that I feel like talking about it any longer would completely undermine its value. If you get nothing else from this video, Go watch this episode immediately. The second episode, co-written by Hunter Schaefer, delves much deeper into Jules, her relationship with herself and her gender identity, her attachment to Rue, and the way that coalesces with her trauma surrounding her mother, as well as the authenticity and liberation she felt in her falsified online relationship from season one. I already love Jules from season one alone, but with Hunter Schaefer sharing that writing credit, I think we get even more layers of nuance to her character through this episode. She gets some of the emotional processing and closure that didn't happen by season one's conclusion, which feels entirely necessary both for the character and the audience going into season two, because in season two, they basically disregard her entirely. Season two is a f***ing mess. A mess that I thoroughly enjoyed, but one that I would not judge anyone for despising. Season 2 almost entirely throws out the character-driven approach of the first season in favor of something a lot more contemplative. While this season does feature probably the best episode of the mainline show, not counting the special episodes, and while it does have its own standout moments here and there, the season by the end became entirely preoccupied with examining its own audience's relationship with Euphoria, especially the first season, as well as the audience's relationship with art in general. I believe that the play put on at the end of the season was meant to have audiences examine and understand how the show was made, how art is a processing of personal experiences and in many ways a reflection of reality, a reality that often hurts people, especially those closest to the material. This is especially true through the eyes of the Lexi character, creating a play that, apart from its campy nature, might as well be an autobiography. One that is a limited perspective, that unfairly characterizes her own sister, showing how daunting it is to create something so personal to you, knowing the vitriol you'll likely receive for it. Which, much like Ali in Special Episode 1, feels like Sam Levinson inserting himself into the story, processing what he created in Season 1 and the audience's reaction to it which is probably my favorite part of the season overall. Two of the things I value most in art and analysis slash criticism of art are expression and perspective. I love that I can just watch a bro -y Day Chanel video on Euphoria and get a perspective on the show and art in general that is not my own. I find watching a video like that to be a deeply revelatory and nourishing experience, because again, that video is just flatly fantastic. That being said though, 
I do not share her perspective on auteurism. Many established directors who are revered as auteurs tend to get a bit wanky in their later filmographies. They get loose with editing, allowing their work to drag on for hours and hours, they self-indulgently reference their early work, and they repeat their own personal styles to the point of parody. The problem with Sam Levinson's later work is not that it prioritizes style, it's that it prioritizes Sam Levinson. I intuitively understand why auteur filmmakers are seen as self-aggrandizing or self-pleasuring, I just don't always see that as a negative. My favorite Tarantino movie is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I thought The Irishman was beautifully told and in some ways felt like Scorsese apologizing for ever making gangsters look appealing. I've long felt that Grand Budapest Hotel is Wes Anderson's best film, even though that's where a lot of other people draw the line. I haven't gotten a chance to see Asteroid City yet, but from what I've heard, I'm sure I'll love it. Maybe I'll report back on that one. I'll give Broy Deschanel this though, Mother, yeah, that's one of the few films I would call pretentious, even if it is extremely entertaining. The point was that even though being able to personally identify with art is a huge factor of why it is so important, and obviously plays a huge role in why I love Euphoria so much, I also equally appreciate when artists get sort of self-indulgent and self-reflective, because it gives me a more authentic opportunity to understand how they see both what they create and the world as a whole. Which I especially appreciate when their perspective is something that I do not have personal experience with. There's just so much value in that to me. If I didn't see the value in that, then Rue's disease of addiction wouldn't be as important to me because I only have experience with addiction from the outside in. If I was only interested in seeing my own reflection in art, I wouldn't love Jules as a character near as much as I do. I wouldn't be interested in her personal music musings on transness or how her mere existence compounds to make her life both internally liberating and unfairly externally dangerous. And I mean, if we're being real, most of the major characters here are women whose experiences are inherently different to mine. But therein also lies the problem with season two and where I agree most with Broey Deschanel's analysis. By the way, I definitely was not saying that Broey Deschanel's point was that you shouldn't empathize with characters who are unlike you. That was a tangent, a rant. What I was trying to say is that auteur filmmakers being self-indulgent can still be an opportunity for empathy and can still have its own value, but sometimes at a cost. Sam Levinson's perspective being prioritized is not inherently wrong to me. Again, it's kind of my favorite part of season two, but it does prioritize itself at the expense of major characters, mostly Cassie, but also Kat, Maddie, and McKay. McKay is basically entirely written out. Kat is mostly written out, and when she's not, her inclusion either feels entertaining, but disjointed, or entirely contrived. And Maddie and Cassie and that whole Nate love triangle is just baffling and regressive. I really do hate to keep pulling out Joker comparisons over and over, but come on. Inviting me on the show. You just wanted to make fun of me. What do you get? I don't think so. When you cross I think a mentally ill loner with a it. society that abandons him and treats him like they trash. Call the police, I'll Gene. tell you what you get. Call the police. You get what you f***ing deserve. Get the f*** I am just so sick of the writing crutch of making a character indiscriminately spiteful and irrational to force drama into the story. All art is collaborative to one degree or another, so I feel bad for implying the blame for the sloppiness is on any one particular person, but seeing the Hunter Schaefer writing credit in Special Episode 2 did give me hope that each character was going to be given new layers of depth and authenticity, that they would each be more informed by the personal experiences of each actor who portrays them. But instead, it feels very clear where the priorities are and where they are not. Even more so than the first season, season two completely loses itself in minutia. It just kind of meanders across different ideas and only takes time to really focus on the things it truly cares about, which plainly sucks because again, the characters and the way they're performed are the show's greatest strength to me, 
still. I can totally understand why people who are looking forward to seeing how each of these characters grow and change as people would be bitterly disappointed by season two. I'm a little bit disappointed even. But at the end of the day, I just kind of took it for what it was, a largely unfocused, messy piece of self-reflection, which sometimes despite itself, managed to be wildly entertaining and deeply emotionally resonant. And I think that's a pretty good distillation of how I feel about Euphoria as a whole. I'm very conflicted. It's both gut-wrenching and heartwarming. It was an illuminating mess. Sometimes it gives me hope for this world, sometimes it really, really pisses me off, but through all of that, it is authentic and actually makes me feel something. I know this probably won't be enough justification for a lot of people watching this, but I think the reason I'm so forgiving of Euphoria in areas where I am not at all with other shows is because even at its worst, it's incredibly human. 